welcome to the Botanical Institute. We are this year's iGEM team of the University of Zurich and I'm proud to present you our project. It is a fact that microbial pollution of drinking water is an issue that fundamentally affects the health and well-being of our society. There are 3.4 million people dying annually due to waterborne pathogens with many more falling ill. Well-known diseases such as Legionnaires disease or Salmonella are among those perpetrators. And even in Switzerland, known for its pure drinking water, we face upwards of 400 cases of Legionnaires disease every year. A disease that even with the best care in the world has a fatality rate of 5 to 10 percent. And that is only one of many bacterial pathogens plaguing our water supplies. If one considers the water quality found in developing countries, it should become evident that these countries face even a greater challenge when it comes to dealing with waterborne pathogens. Currently, there are multiple options available to sense and combat microbial pollution in water, but the problem is far from solved and all these methods have drawbacks. When looking at rapid detection methods specifically, we observe that these are all either inaccurate, such as ADP pens, unquantifiable, such as dipsticks, or expensive and require equipment such as flow cytometry. Of course, traditional techniques have advantages as well, but we believe that we can exploit a new niche that is currently sitting empty. We decided to face the challenge and wanted to construct a novel biosensor with less disadvantages and specifically focusing on the cheap rapid detection sector. After some consideration, we came to the conclusion that we don't have to look far and try to reinvent the wheel, but that nature has already found the solution. Therefore, we decided to make use of the immune system of plants, more specifically in the first line of defense, that is the pattern recognition receptors, PRRs. In plants, cell surface mediated immunity is achieved through the expression of PRRs, which recognize pathogen or microbe associated molecular patterns, PAMs or MAMs. Once a PAM is recognized by the appropriate PRR, this will induce an immune response. Some receptors are targeted against more specific microbial structures, while others will recognize a broad spectrum by binding to highly conserved structures. As for example, the PRR FLS2, which binds flagellin 22, that is a component of bacterial flagellin. With this in mind, it should come to no surprise that plant immunity and PRRs are heavily investigated in regard to transgenic immunity in agriculture. Our goal became not only to create a PRR-based microbial detection system, but also to lay the groundwork for future systems that wish to implement PRRs in microorganisms such as biosensors, since this field is currently not developed at all. To discover how we could make our project solve real issues, we listened to the opinions of many experts and adapted our system with their feedback. To understand our journey in human practices, I have to first introduce you to where we began our project. Since the beginning, we were interested in biosensing as a cheap and simple way to detect environmental pollution. Upon a discussion with our lab, we decided that PRRs could be a way to achieve this. We wanted to make use of PRRs to create a simple and cheap biosensor with a colorimetric visible to the naked eye output that reacts to the presence or absence of bacteria in a water sample. The idea was that anyone could use it, without any training or additional machinery, to be beneficial to developing nations and remote locations. However, during our talks with experts, we realized that this is not where a system like ours would shine. First is the issues with layman sensing, the anyone can use it approach. To us, from the perspective of a lab in the first world, knowing more about the contents of our sample is always beneficial. But in a layman context, especially in the developing world, more information is only useful if it comes with additional options for solutions. Currently, the only option is usually chlorination. This is a simple and relatively harmless treatment, and current methods of testing are sufficient to determine whether a sample must be chlorinated. Our system would have to be able to determine that a sample is safe to drink without being chlorinated. This is something we cannot guarantee with our system, especially considering the harm a false result might cause. This is an intrinsic property of our system. We detect all bacteria equally to detect the total bacterial load. But this alone is not sufficient for a water safety diagnosis, as even very low numbers of harmful bacteria can cause serious harm. Additionally, we are creating a reporter organism, a GMO, 
which despite not being harmful in of itself, cannot be allowed to escape into the environment. As we cannot guarantee that without the cooperation of the user, this is something our system cannot ensure in a layman context. So we moved away from laymen and asked laboratory professionals in water safety what they would desire in a system and found that this is where our project might find its home. Current water testing is lacking in the cheap, low labor intensity and quantifiable sector, somewhere where our system could shine. But to be of use in an expert context, we had to adapt one key aspect of our project completely. Our binary present or absent output would not be of use. Quantification would be absolutely necessary. To that end, we switched from a colorimetric to a luminescence output, gaining greater quantification at the cost of requiring a machine for readouts. So, having taken all of the information we learned from experts into account, we have a new proposed implementation, a proof of concept for plant PRR-based biosensing. Our system serves as a simple early quantification device for the total bacterial cell count, an accessory device to current systems. One simply needs to add the water sample and substrate into a pre-prepared tube and insert that into a luminescence meter. Within 20 minutes, the luminescence meter will give a readout that can be converted into the total bacterial cell count. Due to its simplicity and low cost, it can be applied over many samples, for example, across a distribution network to trace problems with biofilms or post-disinfection regrowth. This is, however, only one application of PRR-based biosensing, a proof of concept. Its future potential we will discuss later in the presentation. Now that we had a goal in mind, we were able to design our biosensing system and plan the experimental approach. So now let us look at the components of our system and the steps necessary to realize our vision. Within the family of plant PRRs, there are two types of receptors, receptor kinases and receptor-like proteins. Both have an extracellular domain, which is responsible for MEMP perception and a transmembrane domain integrating them into the plasma membrane. The pattern-induced immune response is initiated by a cytoplasmatic kinase domain in the receptor kinases, while the receptor-like proteins lack any obvious intracellular signaling domain. Plant PRRs have many properties which make them interesting for applications in synthetic biology. First of all, the binding of the epitope to the PRR is highly specific. Now, and secondly, there really is a plethora of different PRRs, each recognizing a distinct epitope. Another advantage of the plant PRRs is the fact that they share a lot of structural similarities. This property has enabled the development of chimeric receptors and it has also come in handy in designing our own system. We chose to work with three different target receptors. The first is the receptor EFR, which detects the ubiquitous protein elongation factor 2, a protein which is necessary for translation and therefore conserved across all bacteria. The second receptor is FLS2, which is specific to another very common protein, the bacterial flagellin. And finally, we decided to also implement the cold shock protein recognizing receptor, CORI, into our system. All these receptors are receptor kinases and share a very important functional feature. When the bacterial epitope is present, all three receptors interact with the same co-receptor, BAC1. For our project, we expressed the receptors in two different chassis. First, the brewer's yeast Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which we chose because it is one of the best known organisms in biological research, and also due to its ability to be dry frozen over long periods of time. The second organism is the green algae Chlamydomonas reinhardtii, a popular organism for biosynthesis which has been used in iGEM projects before. Now, what is it exactly that we use our receptors for? We expressed a target receptor, for example EFR, 
and its co-receptor back one in our chassis. The intracellular kinase domain, however, has been removed and replaced with each part of a split reporter protein. Now, when the bacterial epitope binds, the two receptors dimerize and the reporter protein gets reconstituted, giving a quantifiable visual output. We decided to use the nanobit system from Promega as this split nanoluc protein will reliably deliver a luminescent output. Now, to test our system, we first examined whether the proteins would get expressed and localized at the cell membrane. So we fused the receptors to a yellow fluorescent protein and expressed this construct in our chassis. This enabled us to visualize expression and localization using a fluorometer and fluorescence microscopy. To assemble the constructs, we chose Golden Gate as our cloning strategy. We inserted five fragments into our vector, a promoter and a terminator, a signal peptide to ensure membrane localization, a receptor protein and the yellow fluorescent protein, which is fused to the receptor via a 15 amino acid linker. Since we used a different vector for our second organism, Chlamydomonas, the constructs were pre-assembled and then inserted into the vector for Chlamydomonas with infusion cloning. The plasmids, which we used in our actual system, were designed and assembled in the same manner. Instead of the yellow fluorescent protein, the split luciferase was fused to the receptor. Co-expression of the constructs make it possible to test with a luminometer whether the split proteins are able to dimerize. The design of our system looks nice and simple on paper but we encountered some challenges during our time in the lab. We tried to work with three different receptors, which turned out to be a bigger challenge than we had anticipated. The work on these many parts did not progress equally well, and in the end, we decided to drop the FLS2 receptor entirely since we had many problems with it. We focused on the BAC1, EFR and CORI receptors. For BAC1, we constructed three different versions. One, with its native signal peptide, BAC+, one with a generic signal peptide for our chassis, BAC-, and one with the intracellular domain removed, EBAC. For EFR and CORI, we only constructed the versions without the intracellular domain. Our first major milestone was to show that our assembly worked for expressing the constructs in our main chassis, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. For that, we fused the receptors to yellow fluorescent protein, YFP, and introduced the plasmid into yeast. If the plasmid is expressed correctly, we should be able to measure higher fluorescence levels in our transformed yeast strains. To measure the fluorescence, we conducted two main experiments. First, we measured the fluorescence levels of our samples in a plate reader at 485 nanometer excitation wavelength. The bar chart here shows emission intensity normalized for cell density. Each construct was measured in biological triplicates and technical triplicates for each biological replicate. All constructs except for the Cori receptor showed higher fluorescence levels than the control especially BAC1 without the native signal domain, ectodomain only BAC1, and EFR. This shows that the constructs are correctly expressed in our chassis, which is a great first result. To verify this result, fluorescence intensity was also measured with a flow cytometer. Here, each graph represents the distribution of fluorescence intensity for 100,000 measured cells per sample displayed in a log scale. Subsequently, the replicates for each construct were pooled together and 200,000 cells per sample were measured. This violin chart here again shows much higher fluorescence levels than the control for all samples except Cori. 
The YFP constructs also allowed us to check by microscopy if the receptors localize correctly at the cell membrane by checking if the receptor fluorescence overlaps with the cell membrane stain. This image here shows the YFP in yellow, membrane stain in pink and the merge of all channels. For ectodomain only BAC1, eBAC, we found cells where the membrane stain and YFP clearly overlap, thus indicating that the constructs are trafficked correctly to the membrane. Similarly promising results were observed for EFR, one of our main receptors. For BAC-, which has a yeast signal peptide, weak membrane localization was observed. In comparison to BAC+, which contains the native signal peptide, did not localize at the membrane. This shows that the yeast signal peptide is crucial for correct localization. Finally, CORI, which is our only expressed weekly, did not localize correctly. We tested the dimerization of PRR receptors and co-receptor by fusing each one to one half of a split luciferase enzyme called Nanobit. Theoretically, the presence of the corresponding epitope for the receptor should drive dimerization which would restore the function of the luciferase and with that increase the luminescence level. In this plot you can see the time series luminescence measurements for EFR and CORI co-expressed with BAC1. Contrary to our expectations, cells treated with any epitope did not show a significant increase of the luminescence compared to the untreated control. In fact, the untreated control does show some luminescence. This is likely the result of dimerization driven by the inherent affinity of the two nanobit halves. As of now, the PRR epitopes do not trigger dimerization. Generally, EFR showed higher luminescence than CORI, matching our expectations from previous results. Our control showed no background luminescence. To summarize, we successfully demonstrated expression and localization of PRRs in our chassis. With that, our next steps would be to investigate the dimerization of receptor and co-receptor further. With that solved, a proof-of-concept biosensor could be designed with all parts of the system in place. If the functionality and quantifiability of that system are demonstrated, the doors are wide open for future applications of PRRs in synthetic biology. Demonstrating the viability of one of these receptors could indicate that many more from the same receptor family could work due to their biochemical similarity. Additionally, one of the key advantages of our system is its modularity. The output can be easily adapted to fit the desired application. For example, a colorimetric output visible to the naked eye could be achieved using a split beta-galactosidase. There are also systems that release transcription factors through pandimerization, which then turn on genes that code for different outputs. The combination of different outputs and the ability to interchange receptors means that our system has a lot of potential to be explored for future applications. With our results, we have laid the groundwork for PRR-based biosensing in microorganisms. We invite future iGEM teams and researchers to pick up the mantle, or rather the lab coat, to continue our work and to explore the future potential of PRR-based biosensing.